Hello and welcome back to the Baltic Sea Security Conference. Now we will continue with the panel on societal security and uh, we have chosen our good colleague and uh, one of the best Baltic experts in the United States, uh, Ms. Maya Otarashvili from the Foreign Policy Research Institute to uh, lead this panel. Uh, we may recommend very well the programming that they are doing in Philadelphia with regard to our region. And so uh, in our opinion, uh, Maya will be the best uh, to uh, coordinate the proceedings of this panel. So Maya, please, the floor is yours. So um, we are delighted at FPRI to be following the Baltic Sea region and of course we're grateful for our partnership with your organization. Yes, so today's panel is, this panel is about uh, societal security. Um, we have some very interesting uh, speakers uh, lined up for you. Um, my apologies in advance if I butcher some of these names. We have Dr. V Victoria Rusinaite. She's from the European Center of Excellence for Hybrid Security. We have Mr. Erling Johansson from Sweden. Um, we have Ms. Anneli Reima from the Ministry of Culture in Estonia. And we have Dr. Alexandra uh, Kuczynska Zonik from the Institute of Central Europe in Poland. And last but not least, we have Dr. Uh, Soren Dosendord um, from uh, Aalborg University in Denmark. Um, what I was hoping we would do is um, each of our speakers um, can speak for five minutes, make their initial remarks um, about their their topics. So that should give us still good 30 minutes for for a discussion. I'm, I'm hoping we can have a an engaged discussion and make this as interactive as we can with our audience. So I want to encourage everyone to send in their questions through the, the Q&A feature. And um, I, I promise I'm going to do my best to get to get to everybody's questions as much as we can. It might be best for us to maybe um, go with uh, Mr. Erling Johansson first and then come back to Victoria. Yes, Thank I'm you. ready. Good afternoon and good morning, US. And my contribution today in the social and collective security is about uh, lessons learned that we shall uh, take use of what happened before. And I will talk about how Russian news, in fact, Sputnik news, the fi fiasco in Sweden. And the background is that the Sputnik news, they started to send news in Swedish language, also in other Scandinavian language on April 15, 2015 but stopped their news service already in March 2016. There was no official explanation by Sputnik News, but other Russian media discussed the closing of the service. And the background for this was that uh, during the Cold War, we knew that Soviet Union, they developed an information operation strategy by spreading disinformation with many different messages about the same event at the same time. And this strategy is still in use in Russia today, as we know, and Russia tried to use state-owned media as public news for this strategy in Sweden a few years ago, but it did not work. And there are explanations for this. Today, spreading negative information about Sweden from Russia is centralized for Moscow and not from any new service in, based in Stockholm or Helsinki. We can see that in mid-October, false information was published by Russia about the coming Swedish government bill on defense. We mentioned this government bill in, this, uh, in the seminar before lunch, where we have the big coming uh, defense bill on December the 15th that will strengthen the security in the Baltic area, especially in the Baltics. There was disinformation about this. And a new attempt for disinformation was ju done just two, three weeks ago when we read that Anonymous had informed Danish radio that USA had spinached on Swedish Defense Institute by using Danish internet service and internet service uh, institutions. The few comment on both these, that was it an attempt from third party to create a split between Sweden and Denmark. 
This Russian disinformation and also the former Soviet Union disinformation follow in the most cases a model. I have a model of this on a picture one. We shall see if we can get it up from Riga from the host so you can see the model. Yeah, you have it. I use a very well-known Soviet or nowadays Russian message about the Baltic people as an illustrated example. And the message is from Russia could be all balls are fascists. And that gives in this model that the Balts, they answer, we are not and start to arguing against this. It has also a domestic effect, the Russia to Russians. They will answer, yes, we know that all balls are fascist. But the most important is when this message, this message or narrative will be taken up by a third part, because then we can have a follow up. For example, as a follow up is that after two, three weeks, we can read in Russian news that the neutral and well-known Swedish newspaper, Daily News, writes that all balls are fascists. There you have the pickup. So the most important in this kind of disinformation is not to attack the target directly, but to get a follow up and involve third parties. But when a message with this information get no response, either from the target nor domestic effect, there is no possibility to make a disinformation follow up. One present known method for this kind of disinformation or distraction, or shall I say split up relations, is the use of the nowadays so-called troll factories. But we shall remember that the troll factories cannot build their arguments or narratives or lose sand or empty air. From the beginning, there must be something that a significant part of the society or population perceives as a problem. So in short, in a stable democracy, it's difficult to perform a negative campaign or spread unpopular proposals, no matter how much effort Russia puts into this operation or into the mis uh, into emission. So I am of the opinion that there's no simple and golden methods or any quick fixes for a nation to avoid the present Russian disinformation. Because the basic is a well-educated so so society where every single person is able to draw its own conclusions from an available information. That's the reason, I think, and was also discussed in other Russian media, that Sputnik News closed their service in Scandinavian or Swedish language in both Stockholm and Helsinki. So a first step, as a lesson learned, is to teach the people or the society to trust their own authorities, but I will rise a little bit of warning finger because the most effective way of disinformation is when a formally or fully former trustworthy source reports a false message. So this is a danger to consider. When we have sources that we rely on, suddenly they report something unexpected. So it's essential to always be on alert and assess the information and not the source because this is the main advice from nowadays many experts that I see who is the sending, but look at the message, because this seems to have been forgotten, because that was the old way of dealing with Maskerovka, that we looked at the information first and not the sources. And that is a little bit of my lessons learned about why Sputnik News fiasco uh, in Sweden. And that will be my five minutes. Oh, five plus, I see. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's that's so interesting. And I think that resonates not just for for the um, Baltic uh, Sea uh, neighboring countries, but definitely over here in the United States. So I'm going to have a few follow up questions for you. Um, so let me turn over to Victoria now. I think uh, we have we have a good connection now. So can you? Yep. Great. All right. Thank you, Maya. Uh, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be here with you all today and to dis engage into this discussion about societal security, which I think already evident from the previous uh, 
statement that is a cross-cutting topic in the whole security discussion uh, since societal security issues such as disinformation or like fostering swing groups in the society or socioeconomic disparities are likely to influence all other security domains such as for example political or military or legal and so on so I think this current situation with uh, COVID-19 especially reminds us about the importance of societal security and shows how, if not taken into account and dealt with, societal security issues might become very important and especially in crises that are taking place in other domains, such as health care. For example, the current data shows that fewer people today say they would get COVID-19 vaccine than three months ago. So this shows how the effects of disinformation, uh, what kind of effect disinformation can have on populations. So in my statement, very short statement today here, I would like to focus on the importance of three issues that uh, came out of our earlier work uh, uh, with the Baltic Security Foundation. So uh, one issue is uh, uh, that collaborative whole government approach should be active not only in reaction to the crisis situation, but also in fostering resilience and preemptive societal security approaches. So it's also something that was touched upon in the previous uh, position statement and uh, First, societal security issues are those that should be dealt in advance and not in only in crisis situations. And definitely it is much more difficult to uh, deal with them in crisis situations, even if that is possible. Then the other issue that I want to take up today is taking national initiative to foster societal resilience and address existing problems. And then the third issue is focusing on multinational dimension where relevant and where it's important to foster societal uh, security. So, as I said, uh, societal security is a multi-domain issue, uh, but it, it can only be grasped in cooperation of different ministries and different agencies. And not only one, we want to react and debunk, for example, fake news, as in case of disinformation, but we want to foster resilience to overall media consumption and uh, uh, overall uh, disinformation. So, for example, such instruments as mandatory media literacy lessons in schools or cultural events that foster critical thinking, also the, the work of intelligence agencies, this falls into kind of all the different domains of different ministries and agencies. And there, I think there should be and I know that in some countries, such as uh, Finland, for example, but probably Sweden as well, there are uh, coordinating bodies uh, composed of different representatives of different agencies, for example, to address hybrid threats or COVID situation. So these are examples that could be learned from uh, in states such as Lithuania, but also other Baltic states on how to tackle threats that do not fall into single domain. Uh, but we also, I think, especially in the Baltic states, we want to improve the ways in, in which we take national initiatives. Uh, so uh, previous to my current positioning, for a long time I was working in civil society organizations, and I noticed that significant financial allocations, for example, in innovations in how to... Uh, counter disinformation come not from the country, but from the Western partners. So we're actually looking at the Western partners for innovations on how to fight disinformation, while our own initiative in this case would be little. And I think we want to change, change the situation and have more national initiative and to work more on how to tackle those things nationally. Um, I think other problems, uh, the problem is that uh, if political sphere is very fragmented, it's very easy to kind of mold different issues into threats from Kremlin. Um, for example, we had in Lithuania one adv advisor to the Lithuanian PM 
called teachers who were protesting against low wages people influenced by Kremlin agents. So <laughs> I don't think this is the right way to go about this information because it's kind of moves and models all the talk about uh, security issues into some kind of I don't know, a bulk of stuff that is really unclear and used for unclear political purposes. Um, so in societies, societal security, I think many issues can be actually prevented by fostering societal cohesion. So working to address socioeconomic inequalities, having high quality education and health care, and this way increasing trust in institutions. So this increasing trust in institutions that uh, in security sphere, I think we often uh, stress, it's not only that, you know, forcing people to, to trust in institutions, but this is a very long-term work on how to uh, create this trust that is based on facts and based on what's actually going on instead of based on images and how some institutions would present themselves as trustable. Uh, so this, in a sense, is, let's say, hybrid deterrence by denial. So we deter uh, threats uh, in societal security domain by not allowing our adversaries to use our societies against us. And I think this long-term way is a way for, for societal security issues to be addressed. And last but not least, but this is, I think, most intriguing point for me, but I hope also for, for this conference, as it is focused on interoperability in the Baltic Sea region, uh, we need to focus on our partnerships, right? So while problems might be different, I think we can learn from experiences of other states and what happens in one state will necessarily affect the other. For example, current Astravet's nuclear power plant is built 50 kilometers from main Lithuanian cultural and economical center Vilnius. If you visited it, you know it's a beautiful city with rich history and the power plant has been built in disregard of International Atomic Energy Agency recommendations not to build plants within 100 kilometers of major population centers. And no environmental impact and public consultations took place, at least with the Lithuanian side, which is against ESPRO and Aarhus conventions, which are both ratified by Belarus. And already now multiple malfunction incidents are recorded on the side. And in most cases, they're not reported from the Belarusian side in a transparent manner. So this makes climate in Vilnius also in the context of all stuff that's going on in Belarus now, not a very friendly one. So I think international collaboration is needed to address issues like that, to ensure that foreign threats are addressed together because we do not live in a separate security spaces anymore. We live in a common security space. So thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be here today and speak with you about this important yeah, issue. Thank you so much for, for those remarks. Um, I think you brought up a, a few really interesting um, points here that dovetail nicely um, with Erling's remarks as well. I want to turn over to um, Anneli Rema from the Estonian uh, Ministry of uh, Cultural Affairs. Your microphone is muted though, so if you can. There we go, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon from my side and many greetings from Tallinn. Uh, I'm uh, really happy that I can participate uh, in this very interesting conference and talk about societal security, which is one of the very important tasks of our integration policy. Uh, in Estonia and in the whole region. And as you know, security is divided into two main categories. It is military security and non-military security. And I think both parts are very, very important. And so social security relates to the ability of the society to persist in its essential character under changing conditions and possible or actual threats. 
And as we all know, the Western system is uh, vulnerable because plurality of the views, media freedom, religious freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, these are the values that are cherished and defended by the West, but they could be misused to create chaos in the hearts and minds of the people. And nowadays, when the media sphere is very open, we use a lot of social media, then can be fake news and can be myths that uh, can um, make chaos in the, in the societies and, and, and in the region. And so data security, it is like a unique semantic field that can be leading rethinking and make a path for initiators. And as you know, every group in the society wants its needs to be met. And as well, there are minorities, uh, the people with another ethnic background and language. And it means that uh, uh, social, social security concerns the integration and internal security agenda. And uh, the integration policy in Estonia has conflicting goals with the compatriot policy of the Russian Federation. The field of integration is still dominantly focused on the Russophone population who immigrated to Estonia during the Soviet period. And Kefun's uh, society has become an easy target for manipulation and are the risk of political subversion and radicalization. And uh, we uh, know very well that Russia has broken into the Baltic infosphere using Soviet legacy, stereotypes, threats and lies. And it weakens society's trust towards national institutions and creates a separate pseudo-informational space. So Russia tries in the post-Soviet countries to strengthen Russia's ideological vision of a Russian world. And the Russian world is much larger than Russia itself. So many of the Baltic countries' societal resilience challenges are closely related to the Russia's foreign policy thinking. The Russia's compatriots policy is a tool for splitting societies as well. And um, as we know that Russia has regularly expressed concerns over its threatened national interests. And especially one subject is uh, uh, education in Russian language in 40 countries and, uh, and uh, uh, etc. So uh, in Estonia, one of the long-term targets is to abolish language-based segregation that results in different and opposing mindsets and views. And uh, as you know that uh, the Russian speaking population in Estonia is concentrated in Tallinn region by the capital and Idavido county. So we are trying to work a lot with Russian speaking so-called islands in our country that they couldn't be uh, attacked informationally and ideologically by the Russian foreign policy. So what we could do, uh, it's very important to uh, uh, be directed to the Russian speaking minority in our countries uh, and uh, to try to work with them very positively, trying to reach the uh, by different uh, dialogue platforms, by the media. And very important is to have the uh, and promote people to people contacts and cooperate also much more in the sphere of culture to create a more cohesive society. We are trying to support uh, uh, different platforms and people can uh, meet each other uh, to organize joint cultural events and sport uh, events. And what is important, we have to talk uh, or, or uh, promote our culture abroad to be well known in other countries. So the internationalization of culture of the of the Baltic countries abroad is a very, very important. And we are trying to work with civil society and Jews very cheaply to engage people in different organizations, promote partnership and cooperation. And what is very important is to reach 
uh, to everyone by information space and shared media channel. And as you know, that uh, five years ago, 2015, Estonia launched the uh, uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian language TV channel, ETV+. Plus. Uh, it is uh, like a counter uh, act, act to uh, be uh, uh, against the Russian uh, compatriot policy. And uh, the aim of this TV channel is uh, to provide balanced and factual information to Russian speaking minority in Estonia. And uh, if we talk a lot about this COVID crisis, so uh, we can tell that uh, this popularity of this TV channel became much uh, uh, more popular during uh, uh, the spring when uh, the crisis started, that uh, the audience of the media channel uh, be, uh, became four times more <laughs> popular than it was before. That it uh, shows us that if you are crisis, the information from the direct channel is very important and very appreciated. And uh, of course, it's important to keep strategic communication and uh, uh, build up the trust bridges between all members, all societies, communities of uh, the country and region, because uh, propaganda works with myths, perceptions, emotions and images. And of course, our challenge is to reach the whole society. If you're talking about the media literacy, uh, it means that we, are, uh, we have to educate not just uh, the youngsters at school, but uh, also adult people, uh, uh, also elderly people, that they really can um, act uh, and really can um, understand what happens in the media sphere, that uh, they can recognize and counter this information. And of course, if you're talking about social security, we have to talk also about socioeconomic aspects, because uh, if, we, if we, we all know that uh, uh, it's difficult to deny that ethnicity doesn't play a role in the socioeconomical and political opportunity structures, uh, Estonia has largely managed to avoid violent ethnicity-based manifestation uh, with the exception of the 2007 drones, soldier events. But uh, Estonia Integration Policy has launched uh, several initiatives and programs to cooperate close with the local governments and entrepreneurs to promote the multicultural staff in, in the institutions and private sectors. And of course, it's very important um, to support uh, cohesion societies that people feel that we are really working for them that is a, uh, is a trust bridge between the institution, between the governments and the citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, this is a great way for us to continue the discussion about collective efforts and, and sh the sharing of best practices with moving over to um, Dr. Alexandra Kuczynska, um, who is with the Institute of Central Europe in Poland. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate I can uh, take part in this initiative. Um, during uh, the project, my work was devoted to the question of cooperation uh, between the Baltic states and Poland uh, in the field of uh, disinformation. So my uh, outputs uh, will be um, connected with, uh, I, I mean, um, my idea was to uh, find out how those countries uh, can cooperate with each other and uh, deal with the problem of, of uh, disinformation. Uh, it is obvious that um, there are several distinctions between uh, Poland and the Baltic state sense of uh, disinformation. For example, uh, the, the, most, uh, the most visual is that uh, in the Baltic states, the, uh, the problem of uh, Kremlin disinformation, uh, disinformation in uh, Russian language is uh, the most important. In uh, contrast, in Poland, we haven't got um, uh, Russian-speaking minorities, so uh, in, in propaganda and disinformation in Russian is uh, is not uh, 
it's not a problem. However, um, the common strategies are um, uh, against uh, fake news and uh, conspiracy uh, theories, uh, theories, which are disseminated uh, not only by no foreign actors, but also um, by domestic actors. Uh, particularly, um, coronavirus pandemic revealed that uh, there are several uh, different strategies um, and uh, different um, directions um, disseminating of disseminating of um, uh, fake news and uh, dis um, disinformation. Um, this uh, situation revealed that uh, dis disinformation uh, can um, can have uh, have got different multi multidimensional. Um, um, consequences, as it was said about uh, Victoria, that uh, we we can uh, we can find that uh, this in, this information can uh, influence uh, social or political uh, level. Uh, for example, this information uh, can bring can lead to a uh, lack of uh, social trust in public institutions. Uh, if we um, take, for example, latest uh, data from European uh, Parliament, you can, we, we can find out that uh, among those countries where the level of uh, social trust in uh, political institution, uh, the lowest level is, uh, are in, for example, in Poland and Hungary. Um, I realize that a similar situation can be uh, can also be in in Latvia or other uh, European or even uh, Baltic states, uh, European countries or in the Baltic states. However, we um, taking into account that uh, disinformation, propaganda, fake news, uh, which are spread very um, uh, very fast uh, under pandemic situation. Uh, we can uh, we can realize that this is a very important to to um, to um, um, to follow, for example, to follow a restriction um, provided by our, our governments uh, during pandemic uh, situations. So during my uh, my work, I wanted to find out how the cooperation between those states uh, can look like. So uh, I. I find 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 out uh, that uh, the state should um, should uh, straighten uh, their activity. Uh, they they have to um, uh, act, act, be active uh, together. Uh, so so I wanted to underline those uh, collective efforts to increase synergies and links between the countries. They can also uh, that they. Of course, we, we have got um, different networks, different um, formats, international formats where countries can uh, cooperate with each other, for example, um, in NATO or um, in, uh, in European Union. Uh, additionally, we have got new formats such as Free Sea Initiative, which also can contribute to this uh, problem. Uh, what is also important is to share best practices. Uh, it was said that uh, the Baltic states, uh, for example, Estonia, but but also um, uh, Poland, um, they they all have got their own experience in dealing with uh, disinformation, countering uh, misleading narratives. So they can also uh, share those uh, those practices with each other, or even uh, share those practices uh, within. Um, w with other participants, for example, um, uh, share with Ukraine or those countries which also are um, under the um, in the danger of uh, spreading disinformation. Uh, what uh, what is also uh, important is to uh, is to cooperation with independent NGOs, think tanks, uh, academics, and other. Uh, organizations uh, which aim is to um, to, to um, fight with uh, fight against the uh, disinformation or uh, propaganda. So, so once more, collective efforts and uh, be sharing best practices are, in my opinion, very uh, very important. Uh, um, I realize that um, I, I mean I, I don't uh, don't want to. Um, 
to say uh, the same what my excellent uh, colleagues uh, said um, uh, at the beginning, but uh, but uh, mm, in my opinion, uh, it is also important to underline that strategic uh, cooperation, communica strategic communication uh, between society and the uh, government is uh, very important. It's a key mm -hmm. of um, of effective resilience uh, to information threats. So, so once more, uh, this communication should be uh, should be uh, recognized as a priority uh, and uh, be included into crisis management uh, mechanism with uh, disinformation. Uh, I think that I can stop here. So maybe uh, next round of uh, of question uh, during next round of question, I will I will add something. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I want to encourage our audience members to send in their questions um, using the, the chat feature on the on the website and I'll be happy to get to those. But um, we have we have quite a few things to dive into. I really want want us to get a little bit more specific and go deeper with with some of the examples of, of the many things that we mentioned here. So with that, let me turn over to to um, Erling Johansson. Um, there is a theme here, right? So uh, the, this idea of strategic communication between the government and the society and how important that is. And you added in the case of Sp Sputnik's failure um, in, in Sweden, you said, you know, people, people must trust their own local sources. There needs to be trust in the institutions. Um, I'm sitting in the United States right now where um, our president has coined the, the notion of the media being the enemy of the people. So can you um, give us more specific examples of how the government in Sweden worked to make sure that the media was not perceived as the enemy of the people. Um, and, you know, from, from that, I want to sort of move over to uh, everybody else, because I really want to have this discussion about this notion of trust in institutions, because earlier, Victoria mentioned how there is a fragmented political situation. And again, that's not just in the United States. We seem to see that all over Europe as well. So in the climate of such fragmented political situation, how do we ensure this clear line of communication between the government and the society? I think that's that's a really big challenge that that some of some of the Baltic countries have uh, figured out quite nicely. So I, I want to make sure we talk about those examples. So with that, let me let me turn over to Erling first, and then maybe uh, Victoria, you could add some some more comments to that. Yes, uh, thank you. I would say that this is an, as a long time, uh, uh, long time, long time work in uh, in Sweden, and it started in uh, the World War Two, because at that time we had, uh, I think it was the first one who wrote about psychological operations in the world. It was Professor Hillian. He later went to United States. So in the early 1950, together with the US Department of Defense, he developed a psychological operation that later became nowadays information operations. And his theories at that time are still valid. The new today is the speed when uh, information is spread and the public, because it takes microseconds, and then everyone in cosmos with the internet connection has received the message. And the most important is to have a fast response because before this message is spread into too many, so it should be a response. And the most important that those lessons learned from the 50s and was used in the United States and used in Sweden is that it's a well-known or a trustworthy person. It must not be a well-known and trustworthy, but it has to be well-known that gives a cross response. It could be a, a football player, not soccer, football in the US. That could be an uh, uh, actress or someone else. But when it comes from a trustworthy source, it should be an authority. And in Sweden, we all not always, but when something happens in, in the so, uh, society, it's a, normally a police officer in uniform that gives the message, or is this a well-known 
uh, journalist at TV. So then about the response from the public, I can have one or two examples in my head when it comes from uh, politicians. And that, that the response to a disinformation must not be an answer about this. And I shall give the example from our former uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Carl Bildt, because he was accused to be involved in a massacre in Krim, Ukraine, and also uh, that he was involved to invite the US to have certain operations in the Scandinavia together with the uh, uh, US forces, and that was secret agreement, etc., etc. He gave it a very fast response and there was not an answer about this information but he said well you know the Russians they talk much when they have had a glass too much so that was not a, an answer neither of Kiev neither about military cooperation but that gives a response back that the Russian could not do any follow-up information because now we have the third party because if they have an answer on that then you have the third party so they have to consider yeah everyone in the world knows that the Russian drink too much and when they drink too much they talk a lot of rubbish so this was an answer to a rubbish talk so this was one kind of an answer back from the politician but the two examples that I mentioned about this uh, in my first five minutes uh, the example that uh, the uh, uh, criticize of this uh, Swedish upcoming government bill and also about the espionage from Sweden through Denmark, there was no answer at all, but a short, short, short statement that, okay, we have noticed this, but all of these arguments from Russia fall to ground because there were no public support in it, so this is most important. Uh, that's a little bit of a short answer on how to deal with the Russians. Don't answer directly, but attack them where they are weak. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me uh, turn over to Victoria Rusinaitze um, and let's continue this, this discussion, this idea of dealing with um, sort of building up trust in institutions and, and giving sort of clear information to the societies to build up resilience in the in the environment of uh, fragmented, fragmented political situation. Um, you mentioned that specifically, so maybe you could give us some more examples of how that has worked uh, well in, in, in certain cases, perhaps. I think you just uh, said this key words, uh, meaning that trust and resilience are built and they're not something that you can have in advance. You <laughs> just cannot have them like that. So I think there needs to be a continuous work and uh, also government taking account accountability for their actions. So uh, throughout like 30 years of independence, uh, I think the situation has changed drastically in the Baltic states uh, in terms of trust in politics. So I remember when I was a kid in the 90s, politics were considered to be something dirty, uh, something where corrupt people would only engage into. You Maya are smiling because you probably know what I'm speaking about, right, uh, from Georgia. So it, it's like... And politics were actually a place. So not all people would engage into politics, but politics would happen in a even separate space, in a separate building or separate institutions. And then all other people would live their lives. And then gradually situation uh, was changing. And I think it is important for building resilience and building trust for people to feel that they're empowered on all levels of politics. So uh, taking, uh, having the sense that they have uh, power over their own lives in communities, in neighborhoods, then in cities, then in the regions, and then you come onto the state level. So if people feel that they have power on those levels of living, that they have influence, and that everybody is equal before the law and the constitution actually works, I think this increases trust and gradually transforms how people see politics and society. 
And I think in the states, uh, which are where situation is closer to the sentiment that you know the state institution can can be trusted, like in the Nordics, uh, as Erling said, the situation with this information is completely different. Uh, Sputnik had to leave Sweden and Finland because you know nobody would read it; it was not effective. So I think in the Baltics we also can gradually come to the situation. We can work to, to increase trust in the institutions. So. I, I believe we cannot change Russia and nor governments in Russia, uh, despite the views on, I don't know, hostile uh, Western democracy exports and, you know, interference in Russian <laughs> affairs through NGOs. But I think what we can change is uh, how institutions work in, in our states that we live in. And I think this is very important. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, I have a question from one of our audience members, and it dovetails with a question I, I had for Alexandra. So um, let me read this really quickly and follow up. Um, so um, those uh, most harmful information campaigns aimed at inflicting divides, polarization, and unrest in target societies could only be countered through a comprehensive and unified approach by well-informed public, civil, and private sectors. And this is something everyone touched upon. How have hybrid threats from Russia changed since the pandemic uh, crisis began? And let me add to that. Um, how are we, you know, how, how have um, these countries dealt with disinformation under the, the pandemic conditions? And obviously technology here um, is, is very important because we're all stuck at home. So Alexandra, maybe you could answer this question and then I want to uh, turn to um, Anneli Rema as well with a follow-up question. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, in my opinion, uh, um, in my opinion, the current situation, the pandemic situation, reveal only that uh, um, coronavirus one of the narrative which uh, was applied by Russia to provide its uh, hitherto strategy, uh, hitherto uh, approach. So, um, uh, coronavirus. Um, issue was uh, just simply used by Russia, but it's not uh, very new. Uh, the strategy, Russia's strategy, Kremlin's strategy towards uh, societies, Baltic state societies, uh, particular Baltic state societies, uh, was, uh, was or um, is aimed to um, uh, weaken social cohesion, to weaken um, social trust into uh, in the institutions. So, uh, in that sense, um, a pandemic uh, pandemic issue uh, applied uh, by uh, narratives by Russia applied in um, Russia's narratives is uh, it's um, it isn't isn't new. Uh, what is uh, what is uh, new is that uh, um, is that new. Technologies, digital technologies, are as uh, are applied uh, as an instrument to um, uh, as a very effective instrument to uh, disseminate those information. Uh, at the beginning, I said that it's not uh, only uh, Russia; uh, it is not only China. I, I mean, um, foreign actors, but uh, most often uh, they are domestic actors. Um, individuals uh, who, who are different own interests. So we have to remember that uh, digital technology can be uh, can be uh, potential, uh, but also can be uh, recognized as some kind of a threat. So, uh, and it is our future, I would say, because we are part of digital, the digital transformation. We cannot avoid uh, this process. What we can do is, uh, is that you can use those programs, uh, those innovations, modernization, technology uh, to fight with this information. Uh, of course, uh, there is an open question how uh, much uh, we can use to deal with this information using technology and artificial intelligence, for example. Can we introduce some kind of censorship to, 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 fight, to, fight, with, uh, to fight against this information? Uh, as I said, it's open open question, uh, so so it is uh, it, it is very difficult to answer that. Uh, what uh, what is important, in my opinion, is that we can um, 
we can uh, educate so our societies to strengthen resilience. Educate societies, uh, I mean, uh, inform about uh, different strategies, different th technologies uh, applied by um, by those actors who disseminate mm, disseminate uh, fake news. So uh, we have to um, um, show uh, we have to show uh, how the uh, information uh, works and uh, what are the instruments and mechanism. Um, of propaganda, so so uh, it is my answer of the question that we have to uh, we have to educate uh, and strengthen um, digital skills uh, among societies, especially those uh, those who are the most vulnerable for those uh, for this information, such as uh, young people, children, and national minorities uh, and disabled people. So, okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's those were really interesting remarks. So that actually sparked a follow up question I have for Miss Rema. What is Estonia's stance on using censorship to fight disinformation? That's one. And two, um, use of technology amidst the pandemic. Who knows technology better than Estonia? Uh, maybe you could give us some examples of of how Estonia has used its its um, technological adv advancements to to fight disinformation regarding coronavirus specifically. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Estonian government uh, trying to reach to every people to explain what are the conditions, how people have to act. And what is the real situation so that every morning we get news uh, in different channels, uh, how many people are fallen or, or just have attacked by the coronavirus, how many sick people we have and so on. So we're trying to disseminate uh, very actual uh, information. And uh, of course, uh, there are different uh, uh, digital technology apps, which are also spread to publicity, how to recognize people and uh, just you can get information. Are you in contact with uh, people who have uh, got virus already? So uh, we are trying uh, to use uh, every e-tool, electronic tool to uh, spread uh, the right and objective information and uh, we have also uh, created uh, a very good network that if there are some uh, news or some information on, from the government side that it can reach to every people in different language so we also think that it's very important to spread news both in Estonian, Russian and English that people who live in our country, they knew what the real situation is. And uh, of course, uh, there are still some people in Estonia who doesn't uh, believe that uh, the virus is real. And it's, of course, a problem, especially uh, the Russian speakers didn't believe for a long time that uh, it's a real danger to, to the uh, uh, people's health and so on. So I think if we, there is a question, how have hybrid, uh, hybrid threats from Russia changed? So uh, I think it's not uh, big changes. Uh, Russian, uh, Russia uh, tries to show how effective they are uh, in the fight with the coronavirus or prevention of the coronavirus, but um, uh, and, and maybe uh, it's, it's a similar, right? It is in propaganda to show that uh, the Western Europe and other countries, they can't manage with uh, uh, the, in the medical side with the virus and so on to just to show how effective is uh, our neighboring country. But uh, there, is, there are not uh, any changes, I think, so that hybrid threats are the same. To, to push uh, rumors to the people and and trying to split the society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Johansson has a, a comment, so let me turn over to you really quickly. 
Yeah, thank you, Helen. You asked us about uh, this information and COVID-19 and I realized how different Sweden is according to other nations, not only about how to deal with the COVID, that we have an own strategy in the world, more or less, but how to deal with this, with our own strategy, is that Sweden, we have press conferences every day open where all media can participate, not only Swedish, but also international, and the authorities and the government participate in this, and it's the same person, more or less, not every day, but they come back at least one, two, three times a week. And they answer not only in Swedish, but in also in English, and I've heard answers in France and in German languages. And as Victoria also said uh, <coughs> earlier, that it is important to involve everyone. And this is a way to involve everyone, to have this transparent, <coughs> press conference, I'm sorry, and have them discussed afterward because those press conferences and the message that the public has received from this is dis immediately discussed in TV, on radio and in the newspapers. And for example, today we had a press conference in Sweden just one hour uh, ago with the uh, Prime Minister where they discussed how to vaccinate the people in the best way. And we just heard that Andy said about the language, that they have the Russian as a problem. We don't see the language as a problem longer in Sweden because of this message that we communicate out to society. If I remember correctly, the latest press conference was then distributed in 24 different languages in Sweden. Because as you, you know, we have a lot of minorities coming from all over the world and they receive the same messages in their own languages even if those transparent press information of course are made in Sweden for the Swedish public. So uh, the Russians attempt to uh, spread this information because there have been a lot of attempt, not only by the COVID, where it come from and how it has come from, and you knew about the 5G and about the Chinese and where it comes from, and also now later that the vaccine will kill half of the population. This argument also will falls to the ground because the people is well educated enough, they can hear trustworthy persons and well-known person tell them about uh, all this information. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Mm -hmm. This was such a fascinating discussion. I have about a million more follow-up questions mm -hmm. with each of you. So thank you for, for such, such great remarks. And I hope we will have a chance to continue this discussion in the future. I want to thank our hosts for having us and for giving us this platform. Um, and of course, I want to thank our audience. So uh, with that, let's close this panel. And I, I know we're getting ready uh, to have uh, General Hodges make, make the closing remarks, make the keynote remarks. So thank you very much.